This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 26, recorded March 21st, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIP, your podcast all about parasites. Joining me today to discuss those parasites is none other than Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vince. Fluttering his eyelids here. What's that all about, Dixon? <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Dixon has a black turtleneck. He does. And blue jeans. He thinks he's Steve Jobs. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. There's only one Steve Jobs. But only he, one. He doesn't know what you know about parasites, though. No, he doesn't. And I don't know what he knows about all the other things that he knows about. That's right. Dixon, we have gone yes. through 25 twips. We have. This is number 26. We have been talking for some time about... The nematodes. Yes. And the last one we talked about was Wucheria bancrofti. <laughs> Wucheria. Oh, my goodness. I still don't get it right. No, Wucheria bancrofti, the cause of the lymphatic filaria. There you go. Now, I notice in your textbook that there are... Others. Oh, there's Oncocerca volvulus. We did that We one. did that. Yes, we did. That's the river, river blindness, blindness one. That's correct. And there are a few others, Loa Loa, Dracunculus medinensis. Medinensis. Uh, those two are of minor medical importance um, meaning, compared to meaning, the first two that we did. Meaning that is, there's less than a million people infected. Or that it doesn't cause much in the way of disease. Either way you look at it, um, I'd rather spend our time discussing the uh, global issues of parasites that really cause a great deal of disease throughout the world. Okay, that seems fair enough. And in well, fact, we could come back to that if you'd like. We could. Some other time. Um, as you probably did in your medical school teachings, you focused on those yeah, parasites of medical exactly importance. Right. I mean, Dracunculus, Dracunculus <laughs> would be... I know, I know. They're tongue twisters. There's no question about it. Uh, Dracunculus metanensis is a worthy... Uh, point of discussion for other reasons, though, because it's likely to be eradicated from the planet. It may become the second thing we've ever gotten rid of. Jacunculus? Really? How yeah. is it being eradicated? Yeah. Well, there's, it's a combination of public health education and filtering water before you drink it. As easy as that, so we don't need a vaccine or a drug. That's correct. And what does Jacunculus look like? I'm paging to the chapter right yeah, now. Yeah, it's... It's a nasty worm, Ooh. actually. It's long and thin, mm. as most other filarial worms are. And it seems to locate in uh, regions of the body which are peripheral to the, the, um, the central uh, issue at hand. That is to say, it doesn't locate in the lymphatics. It doesn't locate uh, in places that you would ordinarily notice them. It, it locates in the, in the lower extremities, basically. Mm. And... Um, it's because of its unique life cycle. We can come back to this. Let's one. come back because I'm looking at the life cycle, and it's I really, very interesting. It's, it's very interesting. interesting. And of course, there's less than fifty thousand cases a year now. Well, even less than that now, because when this book was written, that was quite a while ago yeah. now. And uh, today, there are only a few countries left in which they're reporting cases. So it's been one of those big success stories about um, eradication. Well, Dixon. It seems to me that if we're finished for now with the nematodes, we also did the protozoa. We I also did. did the cestodes. Indeed. What would that leave us? Well, Vince, there's another group of worms that we haven't even touched on yet, the mm -hmm. trematodes. So there are the nematodes and the trematodes. And the cestodes. The cestodes. Those are the three groups of worms. Did we talk? Yes, we did we talk. Did. Of course, your fabulous uh, tapeworms. Your <laughs> In tape our beginning lecture, we uh, had a, an explanation of the way worms were classified. Yeah. 
And so we have round worms, which were the nematodes. Yes. We had segmented flat worms, which were the tapeworms. Right. Cestodes, right? Yeah, yeah. Now and it's now coming have... back. It's all coming back, Dixon. <laughs> and now we have non-segmented flat worms. Non-segmented flat worms. Exactly. They're and not these round. These are the trematodes. These are the trematodes. Where does the name trematode come from? No I'm idea. Sorry you asked me that, Vince, because I'm going to have to plead ignorance. You could give me a list of questions to ask, so I never ask you something you don't know. No, no, I don't mind saying I don't know it, <laughs> and I'm sure that one of our listeners does know the answer to that, so I'm one of, not a... One uh, of our 10 listeners? I'm not an etymologist. One of our 10 listeners? Oh, I think we have more than 10, <laughs> Vince. <laughs> we do. So, um, Yeah, I'm just kidding. Yes, the the... The other name for this group, which is a common name, mm -hmm. are the flukes. The flukes. The flukes. Mm. And there's one in particular that most kids uh, encounter during their high school biology days. It's called Fasciola hepatica. It it's big. It's a liver. It's, is that a liver fluke? It, it, how did you know that? Hepatica. Up. Very perceptive. Eh, come Very on. perceptive. I couldn't do that. <laughs> well, no. That was, okay. So what's fasciola? <laughs> this thing looks. Um, if you if you touched your forefinger on your thumb and made an oval out of mm -hmm. the area, that's how big this thing is. The liver fluke? Yes. But when you ingest it, it's not that big. No, 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 no. Of course not. Otherwise, you'd never eat it. But here, <laughs> it's an enormous organism that can live in your liver and drill holes through it until you finally start to suffer from it. And what's the name again? What? Fasciola hepatica. We're not talking about that today. Though. No, we're not. But we could get to that sometime. It's it's a fluke, okay? So we call these flukes. Here's a liver fluke. And we have flukes that live in the intestinal tract. We have flukes that occupy the bile duct. And so, we have flukes in the ocean that you fish for. And they we have flukes in the ocean that we fish for. Flatfish, right? That, you know what? They don't look different. Did you know, is a fluke uh, local to the northeast? It is. It's a kind of flounder, right? That's correct. That is exactly. It's related to halibut and to uh, go, flounder and fluke. If you and go to the Jersey Shore, soul. all the all the boats, the party boats have fluke. Exactly written on the exactly. side. Exactly, exactly. You know, if I went fishing for them, it would be a fluke if I <laughs> caught one. <laughs> I wasn't good at it. I went out with my father several times, and we had to ask the mates to catch us some fluke in order to bring some home. Mm. They're tough. And you say it looks similar. It does. It has a similar shape. So these flukes are worms, but they're rather short. Yeah. They're not long and sinuous, no, 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 and no. they are not segmented either. That is correct. Right. But they don't all follow the pattern that you would like to think of when you think of vast flukes. And the group today that I would like to begin our discussions on um, are the schistosomes. And they happen to be the exception to the rule in terms of the shape of a fluke. <laughs> they look like a snail. They almost look like roundworms. Well, this uh, this one looks like a worm, but its head has snail-like protuberances. Well, we'll get to that, Vince. It has a very unusual architecture in terms of its anatomy. It does. It does. Look at this adult. Yeah, they're quite remarkable, Dixie, actually. You'll have to send me the photos so I can put them on the website. I will be happy to do so. I think our listeners and our viewers will be uh, astounded. If they haven't seen these before, they will certainly be astounded to realize that something this big can be living in your body, and you... So it's about as big as your... No, 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 no. This is much smaller than that one. The liver fluke is big, but these are not that big. How big are they? A few millimeters? They're a few millimeters, exactly right, but you can still see them with the naked eye. So I, I would like to begin a discussion on them, All right. because they cause a lot of human suffering, and they're found in many, many places throughout the world. Ooh, 200 million people That's a in lot. Africa, and 600 million elsewhere. That's right. That's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. My goodness. I mean, there are 6.8 billion of us. Yes. That's a large percentage. Probably a sixth of us are infected with this. Or or it could be. We That's live a, in endemic areas. Of all the 6.8 billion, how many are infected with some kind of parasite? Not oh. a virus, but the, par the eukaryotic parasites we've been talking well, about. Well, the very first nematode we discussed, the pinworm, is almost ubiquitous in terms of human... Mm -hmm. uh, kind, but we wouldn't consider the adult worm as a parasite. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. let's say six billion out of six point eight billion people encountered enterobius at some time or other during their childhood. Yeah, so that's huge, right? But the next biggest one down from that would be something like Ascaris or Trichuris, 
which is picked up by uh, fecal contaminated soil and food and water, mm -hmm. mostly soil and food. Uh, and then you could say maybe half of the world. Wow. Yeah. Something like three billion people. I don't think we can ever rid, rid ourselves of that burden. Not the way we're going about it, that's for sure. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, I think it's a, it's a simple sanitation issue, but it's so difficult to maintain in some places mm -hmm. that uh, I yeah. think we'll always have it. So anyway, any rate, schistosomiasis uh, is the disease that refers to any one of four entities that are mm -hmm. classified in the human schistosome group. Schistosome, which is the genus. Correct. Then there are four different species that there infect are. humans. And there, there are probably some others too, but these are the main ones. Are they host specific? Are they, they are. Are they specific for well, people? <laughs> I'm going to qualify it because there are some reservoir hosts for right, these no, parasites. But the disease host where it causes pathology. Uh, the primary humans. host is humans. humans. Are there also genera in animals? Sure. Of course there are. Yeah, absolutely. But they don't cross over. They don't cross over to a great extent, but these do. These will infect other primates in addition to people. So I see one of the discoverers here is Bill mm. Harz. That's right. Bill Harz. Bill Hartz. That's right. <laughs> I think there's a photo on the wall out there. There is. I have my heroes. I've just moved into the, uh, the microbiology suite of offices, as uh, <laughs> maybe some of our listeners know. And I brought my pictures of my heroes with me. And one of them is of uh, Theodore Bill Hartz. One of and the original he, discoverers. Well, he didn't discover everything about the mm -hmm. schistosome. Um, so Patrick Manson, then just Patrick Manson, actually did a lot of work on that worm also in Egypt because it was an endemic center. And that was a hotbed for looking at all kinds of parasites, as you recall. Uh, mm -hmm. Biases was uh, one of the ones yeah. that uh, was looked at there and lots of others too. This fellow Bill Harz, yeah. he is responsible for, for Bill Harziasis. Bilharzia, that's right, Bilharziasis. What is that? What is well, that? it's another name for schistosomiasis. Oh, it is another name. It's just, in the old days, before they ah. called it schistosomiasis, they called it Bilharzia. Why did they change it? I guess because they finally named these organisms and decided to make it more uniform. I don't know. Right. You know, why do they change any names? I guess the International uh, Committee on Nomenclature uh, has their... Uh, their rules, and uh, I'm not privy to most of them. All right, what does schistosoma yeah, mean? Yeah, what is it? What is it? It means split body. Schista, of course. A schism, right? Correct. And soma is body. There you go. So Split it's, body. Yeah, and if you look at the pictures that are uh, displayed here, you can see that at least the bigger of the two worms here in this scanning electron micrograph has a, uh, it looks like a groove that runs all the way down the bottom of the worm. Uh, there are two of them in this color photo, figure 33.2. There are two There's worms. A large and a small worm. That's correct. This one, it looks like it has a foot here. That's right. Wow. That's the male. The bigger one is the male. Wow. And the small one it's is the gorgeous. female. Gorgeous. I don't, there, want it. I don't want it in me. <laughs> There's some beautiful aspects to parasites. And this is, when you see them up close like this, you can you marvel at their, um, at their anatomic beauty, to be honest with you. They do have a symmetry about them in a, in a style that sort of attracts us to them. But at the same time, there's a sinister aspect of them. You know that mm -hmm. they are going to infect you, and they want to take advantage of you. Here's a picture here, 33-1, which is black yeah. and white. It's a scanning email also. A, there's a big male and a small female nestled in a groove. It's, they're a loving couple, Vince. They, are, they, they the embrace is, for life. The female is that much smaller. She is. They stay together like this for they life? They do, and it's essential to egg production that they do so. Interesting. And what is the life? How long do these things live? It depends on who you are. If you're a monkey, for instance, yeah. uh, it may last for 10 years. If you're a human, they could last for up to 30 years. 30 years. And if you find out, well, you will find out where they live. When, once you realize where they live, you say, well, how can anything live under those circumstances? Because they live in our blood supply vents. And they're constantly being sampled by our immune system. And yet... Oh, I'm spoiling the story. All right, let's start. So we have four genera. Name them. You haven't named them. But I will now. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> well, the first one was named after Patrick Manson. I'm sorry, I meant four species, not genera. No, that's fine. So Schistosoma mansoni, named after Patrick Manson. Uh, Schistosoma hematobium, which is uh, a parasite that's found primarily in Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one is found in Africa, too, but it's found in other places as well. Schistosoma japonicum. 
take a guess where that's from, Vince. Japan. There you go. Still there now? Uh, no, interestingly enough. It's, in, it's still in China, mm-hmm. and it's still in Southeast Asia, but it is not in Japan. How'd they get rid of it in Japan? Oh, the story there is fantastic. All right, we'll, we'll put it aside. Yeah, they got rid of it in the 1970s. Really? No drugs, no vaccines. And in fact, they didn't even... Uh, no, well, I don't want to spoil it. Okay, so then we have Hematobium japonicum, Mansoni, and, and, uh, and Mekong guy. I bet that's from Vietnam. It is. The Mekong Delta. It is. You know, growing up in the 60s, we learned Vietnamese geography. That's very, very true. In fact, right? I've actually visited the Mekong Delta, so really? it's quite an interesting place. It's where mm. one of the largest freshwater fish in the world is found. What's that? It's a catfish. It can get over 600 pounds, Vince. And is that 10 feet? Huge. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe 10 feet would be right. Did you go there to fish for them? I did not. <laughs> no, I just went as a tourist. You know, like you said, in the 60s, um, we were both, well, I'm a little bit older than you. Um, you certainly are. <laughs> it was very possible that I could have been sent there by our United States government as part of the... Uh, the United States presence in Vietnam during the 60s and 70s. I, I didn't want to avoid that, uh, although it would have been something to be avoided. I um, Instead, I got a job at a hospital which deferred me from draft eligibility, hmm. and I, I didn't go. But I always wanted to go to see what it was like. So You would never have been here today. I, you well, would have I might been killed have. in that, it's, that have been maybe. for TWIP. Maybe. And TWIV, because you started TWIV with me. This is true. Well, maybe I would have found someone uh, else. Ah, you would have found somebody. Come on, Vince. None of us are irreplaceable. <laughs> yeah, we like to think we are. I know. So all of these four species yep. are geographically somewhat limited? Correct. Well, the Japonicum is lo- located in the in the, in Asia. So as you said China, formerly yeah. in Japan. That's right. Mekongi is only in Vietnam? Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? It is an amazing. Do we it's, know why? It's probably a subset of Japonicum. Uh, you know, it's it's morphologically different but not that different and now that we have genomics we can probably say that it's probably 99 percent identical to uh mm-hmm. to japonicum is it because the there is another host for these guys that is geographically limited good question um the i guess the going hypothesis would be yes and, and it was geographically isolated also so it had a chance to begin to speciate perhaps mm. a little bit uh, more because the people living in the Mekong Delta don't get out of that very much. It's a very difficult place to navigate, and right. literally, all right. So people that lived there tended to, tended to stay there, and the snails will learn that all of these have snail hosts. Also, uh, the snails are specific to various regions as well. So that's a very fascinating life cycle. Of snail form. hosts. Yeah, mm. this is this is an amazing organism. It has a life cycle that you couldn't make up. Isaac Asimov couldn't do this one justice. So, are we going to talk about it? We we could do that right now if you'd like. So let's begin with how you I mean, catch. Before we go, oh, okay. one more question. So, Japonicum, sure. Japan, China, Mekongi, Vietnam. Yeah. Where is Hematobium Hemi- and Mansoni? Okay. Africa. Mansoni is well. It has been exported to other places. To come to the U.S. Well, if you consider Puerto Rico as the U.S., the answer is yes. But yes. not the mainland. No. During Saint, the slave importation, it didn't no. come here. St. Lucia? Definitely. Really? That was an, from, that was an endemic center from Africa. Um, South America? Definitely. And from the slave trade, of course. Um, so Mansoni has the widest distribution. Mm-hmm. Hematobium is restricted. I guess 99% of the cases are found in uh, Africa. Does the name have anything to do with the hematoma? No. Which is a no, and in fact, a hematobium. When we come to talking about this particular one, of all of the four, this one has the most unusual life cycle. Okay, got that. Now I got the distribution. Let's move on. So, uh, let's begin this conversation as we have with all of our other presentations as to how do we catch this infection to begin with? What is the transmission cycle of this right. organism? And it's interesting, Vince, because sometimes. Uh, we had to do something in order to catch something, right? We had to eat some contaminated food mm-hmm. or drink some contaminated water. Um, or touch something contaminated. Or touch something contaminated. If, 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 if on the one hand we had to uh, be an active player in the transmission cycle, like sexually transmitted parasitic diseases like trichomonas vaginalis, which we just touched on, 
what um, which that's a protozoan yes it is we didn't talk much about that no no we, we hadn't mentioned it although it's very common yeah it is we, we should can, talk about we it, can though. come back to that okay. that would be fine in fact it, it, there's a good reason for talking about it because of its ability to produce um, molecular hydrogen we could harness it to produce all of our hydrogen is it fuel. Unique that it have the ability to do this? Very few organisms can produce molecular hydrogen. You can make Very it few. in reactors. Well, as, we can do that, but it takes know. energy to make it. And That's true. For this one, it has a special organelle called the hydrogenosome. You know, we're and, drifting. And, and other organisms don't have that? Lots of them don't. Oh, well, let's talk about it then. We'll put sure. It, we'll put it on the list. Absolutely. We need things to do, right? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we're always looking for things to do. So, okay. So, but now we come to schistosomiasis. All you have to do to catch this infection, Vince, is just wade in the water. Must be certain kinds of water, though. Fresh water. Not salt ever. Never. All right, not brackish? No. No, there's, well... Slow-moving, fast-moving, or not moving? (laughs) (laughs) The slower the moving, the better the chances. All right, so you wade in the water. So it has to be pretty shallow, otherwise you'd be swimming. Yeah, like a rice paddy. Do your feet have to be on the bottom? Nope. This thing can swim up to you and just sit on your leg? No, and we discuss this, I'll tell you where it goes. In fact, it has a a, um, proclivity. It has a, uh, a tropism. Mm-hmm. And the tropism is two things. It's negatively geotropic. At, geotropic? Yeah, so it migrates away from the pull of gravity. Interesting. And it's positively phototropic. Mm-hmm. So it migrates towards the largest amount of sunlight in the water column. So these guys are free living in the water? They are. Schistosomas, which are worm like, sort of, right? Well, at this stage, they're like little swimming critters. They're free living, though. Well, the critter just... isn't really good enough for quip. <laughs> what is a critter? <laughs> is it a worm? Uh, of course it's a worm. I mean, it's... Here in this picture, does it look like this? No, it doesn't 3, look 3, like that at decimal? all. It looks like a little fork-tailed microscopic organism. Do we have a picture somewhere? We have here? lots of pictures. Oh, here it is. Is it called a cercaria? <laughs> it is, Vince. It looks like a sperm with a forked tail. Correct. It's interesting. It does, and it's produced by the snail. And the snail has to be infected. Okay, so but, uh, well, let's come back to this one. Okay, so so you're, you're just standing in the water or you're swimming, okay? Yeah. Now, during the act of standing, there is the option for this organism to gain entrance into your body. But mostly when you're walking, all you're doing is splashing water on yourself, okay? Mm-hmm. And little droplets of water, let's say you're, you've got your bathing suit on or something, or you're a farmer and you're, you're plowing your rice fields. Oh, it can happen in a rice field oh, as well. Yeah. Oh, sure. Rice fields have a lot of water on them, right? They do. In the beginning, yeah. they do, at least. They're drained at the end, but in the beginning, they have lots of water. This stage of the infection collects in little drops of water on your skin. And as the water dries around a hair follicle and a hair shaft, you, you can see how this could bring the organism to the area simply by the water shrinking. So you've got drops of water on you which have these cercaria in it. Correct. So there must be a high concentration, no? There can be. So per milliliter, how many cercaria? Uh, we don't know. It varies uh, as to how many snails there are and what their shedding rate is. But what I want to tell you is that these organisms are attracted to us, Vince. We secrete things. Hmm, what do we, we secrete? Well, things like lanolin which is an oil that we produce in our skin. What's the function of lanolin? It's to make our skin smooth and it's pliable. Keeps it nice. We have sebaceous glands. You don't want to dry out and crack, then it would be a problem. Exactly. So we produce these oils based on our own metabolism Mm -hmm. that these other organisms have picked up on and can follow trails of these things until they reach the maximum concentration. other, Other animals don't make lanolin? I didn't say that. So, well, how do they know? Well, they just know that there's a mammal in the pond. So, I mean, what happens, for instance, if uh, three different species made the same molecule and they were and they migrated to all three of them? But then there are other environmental cues that this worm pays attention to once it gets there. So, let's say a dog walked in the rice paddy. Would he, would the dog be infected by this cercaria? How about a uh, chimp or a monkey of some kind? Yes, definitely. Oh. So the dog is not, it, this is, doesn't attract these. Well, I didn't say that he didn't attract them, but it's after the penetration event that the parasite realizes that it's either made a mistake or it's in the right place. I see. So there are levels of recognition 
Just like mosquitoes when they find us, Vince, they don't just uh, go to the CO2 source, okay? They, when they get close enough, they feel body heat. And there are other odors that, mos- that we give off that mosquitoes recognize that mm-hmm. makes them specific for various hosts. Right. So <clears throat> here we are waiting in the water. The water now collects around a hair follicle and a hair shaft. And let's say there are three or four of these sicarii. Because we're waiting along the shoreline in this case, okay? Because mm-hmm. that's where the water is nice and shallow. I'm a little kid. I'm playing. It's hot. It's in the tropics. I'm playing in an irrigation ditch, let's mm-hmm. say in Egypt or in some other African country, some other sub-Saharan African country. And because human feces is used as a fertilizer, there is the option for the stage that we produce that gets this parasite out of us and into the environment to go around in this life cycle. Mm -hmm. So just bear that in mind because it's all tied together. So here we are playing as little kids and we're splashing each other and having a great old time. And as these drops of water are coalescing around our hair follicles and our hair shafts, it's concentrating these little sicarii. And, and as soon as it encounters a hair shaft, there is that environmental cue. It's a tactile thing that causes this parasite to actually try to crawl down the hair shaft. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I recall another parasite went in the hair shaft. Gee, Vince, which ones? Uh, Two worry. of them. Two. Uh, Strongoloides. Bingo. U- and? Ucaria. No. Hookworm. <laughs> yes, good. I gave Vince a visual clue. <laughs> yeah, made your <laughs> finger caught to it. a hook. He caught it. It's Monday morning. I'm sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So those those three groups of organisms can penetrate the unbroken skin. Can you name a bacteria that can do that? Unbroken skin? Unbroken through the skin. hair follicle? No, I can't. doesn't have to go through the hair follicle. I haven't been doing twim long enough to know. What about syphilis? I... What about gonorrhea? Those organisms also can go through unbroken skin. Unbroken skin? Unbroken skin. How do they do that? Good question. I'll have to find out on Twim. Someone out there knows that answer. I know they do. I can see spirochetes because they can corkscrew their way in. I'm not sure about Nigeria. Hmm. But they do it. That's where the shanker comes from. Okay. So uh, this cercaria can go in the hair follicle. It does. Now, once it gets into the hair follicle, of course, it encounters body heat. Right. And this causes the parasite to actually lose its tail. Uh, that so nice forked it's a de- tail. It's a detachable tail. Does that make it able to swim? Is that the function? It does. The swimming motion of the cercaria. In fact, if you went to video and typed out cercaria, I bet you could see some pictures of them actually moving. That would be a good thing for our listeners to do. How does the cercaria get it down the shafts of the hair follicles? Well, it's interesting because they contain on the head part of this organism, which will later on become known as the schistosomula, Mm -hmm. two little sucker discs, one anterior and one ventral. And these little sucker discs allow it to hold on to things. And it can actually inch its way along, Hmm. let's say, a glass slide. And you can see where it's been by looking under the microscope. If you cover a slide with albumin and lanolin, of course, because that's what the molecule that attracts them to it, you can mm-hmm. actually see the little holes that they've made in it wherever their sucker discs have attached to the to the surface of the cover slips. So when it goes down the hair shaft, where does it end up? Ah, it wants to infect your blood supply, but it can't do that first. So it actually penetrates into the subcutaneous tissues by using proteases that it has stored up in its cephalic glands that exits through a pore in the anterior sucker. Great anatomy. Wonderful stuff here. Cysteine proteases that allows this parasite to actually embed itself Mm -hmm. into the matrix of subcutaneous tissues. And there it sits for a, a while, a day or two perhaps, and it's it transforms into the next stage. And at that point, it's known as the schistosomula. You can see a picture of that. I don't know what... what. This is figure 3313, scanning EM of a cercaria. Of right. This so if you put your finger over the tail part, mm-hmm. 
the head part is what's going to be crawling into the skin. The head is producing the enzymes. That's correct. The tail is lost, you said. It's exactly. Just used for swimming and getting to the host. Once it's there, its job is over. Wow. And now it starts to transform into the real bad guy. What is this little pore called? That's the ventral sucker. Yeah, and there's also the, a dorsal sucker. There's an anterior. Anterior mm-hmm. and uh, a ventral. Anterior and ventral. And the, the cephalic glands that this little stage contains um, stores up these uh, secretory um, enzymes. And now it has great use for it. Why is it called them. the cephalic gland? Because it's in the head of the organism. Cephalus. That's right. Got it. And this is just the Soma Mansoni we're All talking of them. about. All of them do this. So Every far, one of them does I this. Because I notice we have three different life cycles here. Well, you could have four even if you put man, uh, the Kanga in there. They all have cercaria going into They're the hair similar. follicle. Okay. They're all similar. So if when you talk about Mansoni, you're talking about all of them in terms of their general principles. Is it Mansoni or Mansoni? Either way. All right. If you're English, it's, I guess it's Mansoni. So we're in the subcutaneal tissue. Uh, by the way, as an, aside, as an aside, there is a house. A house. It's not a house. It's a beautiful building that's been set aside by the um, British uh, Society for Tropical Medicine called Manson House. Mm-hmm. And inside are these beautiful uh, bas-reliefs along the uh, where the ceiling meets the wall. You wouldn't call them... Um, it's not a molding necessarily, all right, but mm-hmm. it's a it's a depiction of uh, various stages of parasites. A freeze. A freeze. F R I E Z E. It's a freeze. Yeah. But it's in three dimensions. Yeah. And uh, it's made out of plaster. It's quite elegant, actually, and they've just redone that uh, within the last ten years. They just. You've been, I guess. I have. I have. I've listened to talks in that uh, place. A lot of uh, tropical medicine talks are given there. And named after Sir Patrick Manson, sure. one of the discoverers of this life cycle. But All look right. at how complicated this is. So, so now we're into the skin, and the schistosomula is undergoing transformation. But what are those transformations? Just the head now, right? Just yeah. the cephalus. And I must tell you, well, it's going to become the whole worm eventually. Sure, sure. That each one of these little sicarii is either going to become a male or a female parasite. And what will determine that? That's a very good question. I think genetics somewhere in the snail. Not the host. That's for sure. So Did these come in either as male or female sicarii. When they drop their tails, they're now female or male. Right, just got a it. Somule. Got it. All right. So they spend a little bit of time in the skin, transforming to the... And it doesn't look different than the stage that just crawled into the skin. When you look at it, it doesn't look like it's done anything. Mm -hmm. But it has done some remarkable things, Vince. It's developed the ability to detect where the capillaries are. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, they now burrow into the capillary. And the venous return takes them to the heart and then into the lungs. Do we know how they sense the capillary? We do not. They have a nervous system. But we don't know All right. what their abilities are. And so get into the bloodstream. It might be temperature. They're following a thermal gradient. All these Maybe. worms have the ability Maybe. to follow thermal gradients. So the capillary would be the hottest place, right? And the cooler place would be in the skin. So they could follow this thermal gradient until they reach the capillary. So then they burrow into the They penetrate capillary. into the capillary. Uh-huh. And the capillary leads to the venule. The venule leads to the vein. The vein leads to the heart. heart. The heart leads to the... Lungs. lungs, yeah. Now, now the real stuff, the real fun stuff starts, Vince. Mm-hmm. This is, this is where I would pause in class and say, and I, I tell you what, I want to show you a clip from a movie before I talk about the next part, and I want to show you this movie because I think you'll enjoy it. Number one, number two is because you don't have to take notes. Number three is that it's not what you think you'll look at. You might know what you're looking at because you've seen this movie before. It's called Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. You think you know what this movie is about. So let me show you this clip first, and then we'll come back to it and play it again, only without the sound, and I will narrate the second version of the clip. You actually show this in your class? Yep. Hmm. 
and you could actually get this one up on a video too. Um, so the the clip that I show is Arnold running through the woods, being chased by the Predator, mm -hmm. which is this monster from some other planet. He's down on Earth to go hunting, and we are the prey. And he's using these. Uh, well, I'll I'll <laughs> tell you what he's using in a minute, but everybody else thinks they know, but they don't. <laughs> so here's Arnold running through the woods, and he's looking back, and you hear this loud music playing like he's being chased by it's chase music right and he's crashing through all this underbrush and he's somewhere in venezuela i guess and uh, the next thing you know arnold comes to a cliff but he can't help himself he slips on this mud and uh it's the only swear word in the whole movie that arnold actually says as he goes off the cliff because he doesn't know what's down below but there's fortunately a big deep river now, it just so happens. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be the end of the movie. Um, he plunges into the river. And, of course, he's exhausted from running and everything else. But, you know, Arnold, he was in good shape then. He might not be in such good shape now, having been governor for a while, right? But So here he is in the water. And now he's being carried down the river. And, of course, he thinks he's home free. But ahead of him, he hears some more noise, and this is the noise of a waterfall. Oh my god, oh jeez, now what's he going to do? So he goes over the waterfall, and now he's he must have been battered around on the rocks and stuff, although he's not bleeding. <clears throat> so Arnold eventually makes it to dry land. But it's not just dry land, it's like, in the middle, it almost looks like a mangrove swamp. And Arnold grabs a hold of these roots that he pulls himself up to the land on it, and he schmears himself. That's the only way I can put it, a schmear. Do you know what a schmear is, Vince? Yeah, you put it on your bagel, yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's a little bit of cream cheese, yeah. right? Yeah. So Arnold gets schmeared with the mud from the bank, and he turns himself around and grabs a hold of these root systems, and he's exhausted, and he's just panting. And all of a sudden, Vince, believe it or not, the monster is shown plunging into the water. You don't see the monster. You just see the effect of something invisible going in the water, just where Arnold did. Because he's following him. And he goes down, and this darn thing comes up out of the water, right in front of Arnold. And Arnold is just, he's prepared for the worst. He's going to be vaporized. And he's looking at him. And the monster <laughs> doesn't even notice he's there. He's looking around like, where the hell did he go? Where the hell did he go? And Arnold is looking up. And you know, he gets pretty aggressive when he gets angry. So Arnold says, go ahead, go ahead, kill me, kill me. And the monster is, he can't hear, thank goodness, because otherwise he would have discovered him. <laughs> he doesn't have the sense of hearing, because on his planet, they don't need it. So what's he doing? He's looking around for Arnold. And he gets out. All of a sudden, he sees this. And then you get to see what the world looks like through the monster's eyes. He sees an infrared signature of something, and he thinks, that's Arnold. So he takes out his claw, and on his arm, he punches some buttons, and up pops a little laser gun. He pushes the button and vaporizes the infrared signature, but it's not Arnold. Meanwhile, Arnold is looking at this monster running. He can't see me. I didn't say that right. He says, you can't see me. <laughs> no, you can't see me. <laughs> you must, I must be covered with mud. You can't see me. Ha, 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 He's saying that inside. Of course, he's not laughing, but he's, he now realizes he's got a secret weapon. He can hide from the monster simply by covering his infrared signature over with mud. And the monster then trapes off into the woods. Hmm. And the students are, yay, they're cheering for Arnold. And I said, oh, you, you're cheering for the wrong entity. Because he's the parasite. Huh? Yeah, that's <laughs> what he is. <laughs> Arnold turns out to be the worm. Yeah. And the invisible organism, this monster, turns out to be our angry macrophage. And the angry macrophages, at some point, cannot recognize this parasite in our bodies. They can recognize the parasite when it penetrates the skin. They can recognize the parasite when it uh, gets into the subcutaneous tissues. Mm -hmm. And they can recognize the parasite when it's in the capillaries, but they can't recognize it after it goes into the lungs. Why is that? Well, if I knew the answer to that one, Vince, I might have won a Nobel Prize. So you say it's recognized in the other sites, but what is the consequence of that recognition? The consequence of the recognition is you can kill it. How so? 
with IgE uh. and eosinophils. Those two in combination will kill the schistosomule in the skin. How do we know this? Well, because there's a lookalike organism that infects us, but it doesn't completely infect you. Mm-hmm. It's called schistosomatium dolphati. And schistosomatium dolphati infects birds. So it has the carrier that looks just like the ones that uh, yeah, come from the other schistosomes. Is this when the birds are wading in water? That's right. And you can get this. This is a saltwater transmitted thing or a freshwater transmitted thing. Depends on which ones you're dealing with. But mm-hmm. the schistosomatium organisms can't complete their life cycles in humans because we don't look like birds in any way, shape, or form after the penetration event, but not before. So you can develop hypersensitivity to these things the second or third season if you go back to the same resort, which has these Mississippi or Atlantic flyway bird migrations associated with them, like out on Long Island, for instance. It's called clam diggers itch if you go out there. Hmm. And what is it? It's the manifestation of our immune system against the schistosoma, or the schistosomula. Cercaria. Uh, well, it's, it's not already that transformed, many. right? It's already transformed, and the immune system has caught on to this because the first time around, they all died and released their antigens so that we could respond to them. The second time, we've become hypersensitive to them, okay? Well, the same thing happens in endemic zones for schistosoma mansoni and schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma japonicum. It is the same mechanism that limits those parasites in us as well. But after they get to the lungs, they're home free. Now, in an infection with a schistosoma monsoni, humans, mm-hmm. the first encounter, you, you're not going to clear it because you don't have a memory. That's correct. So they're gonna, you're going to be infected if you have enough. And none how many, of how these... many do you have to be infected? How many cercaria do you need? Just one? Two? You need a male and a female. Yes, this creates the other problem for the parasite, but it's a solution, though, too. Imagine how big we look to it. Sure. And we're an enormous entity, right? And so here's the experiment. <laughs> it's quite amazing, actually. You can do this in rats, but it doesn't complete the life cycle in rats. But it does up to a certain point. They mm-hmm. will make males and females worms, adult worms, okay? Mm-hmm. You can give one of these cicariae to a rat. Then a week later, if that's a male, you can give another one that might be a female. And they eventually find each other. This, this is reminiscent of another one. It is. I can't remember which. <laughs> do you remember? Well, the hookworms do that. <clears throat> you could put one at one time and then later Trichinella. Another. Okay. Trichinella will do that as well. So these worms have re- remarkable homing devices for each other, yeah. as well as for us. So their nervous systems are incredibly well developed for what they have to do. They're simple, but they're complex. All right, so... This parasite, and I, I hope I have all of the listeners on the edge of their chairs because they don't know what happens next, okay? The, the, what happens next is that this parasite now migrates from the lung fields in the face of these huge amounts of immune response capabilities down into the blood supply first and then to the mesenteric lymph, uh, the mesenteric venules. It eventually, this worm, as a very small, tiny little worm, uh, uh, oh, no, no, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke, I misspoke. From the lung fields, it does get into the circulation, mm-hmm. but it goes to the liver next. The liver. So it reached the lungs via the venous circulation. And then in the lung, it switches to the arterial circulation. Which carries it throughout the body. And it goes back to the heart. Right. And it's pumped out. That's correct. So there is a there is an arterial and a venual circulation in the liver. And the parasite reaches the liver. It, of course, it could reach a lot of other organs, too. We don't know what happens to it if it reaches an organ that's not the liver. How about brain? Does it ever go there? No. The answer is, of course it does. But I'll, I'll, I'll describe that after I tell you what happens in the normal situation first. So we go to the liver. Go to the liver. Got it. Now, it, But it's still the same size as it was when it entered the body. It hasn't grown any, okay? But it's now completely camouflaged. So another uh, analogy to that would have been the... Um, the kinds of things that we were discussing the other day about the decorated crab or the, um, the orchid mantis, mm-hmm. they all have a way of disguising themselves to avoid predation or to avoid being detected by their prey. 
And so in this case, schistosomes protect themselves from being identified by the host mm -hmm. by covering themselves with what? Mud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with mud. We are from mud. Yes, we are made from dirt. We arose from dust and we no, will no, return to dust. They must cover themselves with something they produce, right? Vince, if you were this parasite, what would you cover yourself with to prevent yourself from being detected? I'd what, take something from which, the host. Which molecule would you pick? Take something from the host, You're living right? in the blood supply. Hemoglobin? Yeah, not such a common molecule in the blood supply. It's, it's in the blood cells, but not in the blood system itself. Mm, serum albumins? There you go. Albumin. Uh, what other proteins are in the serum? That's the biggest, that's the most abundant, I that's believe, true. right? That's true. That's exactly right. I don't know. What, there are many, many others. There's ceruloplasm. Yeah, sure. Right? That's a copper-containing or transporting molecule. There's a whole bunch of other serum proteins mm -hmm. that are in blood. Yes? So, so the worm is coating itself with these proteins. What if I told you that the parasite doesn't discriminate among proteins? It just will take any old protein and put it on its surface. I would not be surprised. Well, what does this tell you about the ability of this parasite, then? To cover itself with mud. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't matter what kind of mud. As long yeah. as it's your mud. Just cover itself with the herbal protein so it's not recognized as foreign. Right. And, and what would you predict to be the interaction at the surface of the organism which would allow this to occur? Well, there could be electrostatic interactions. Could be. Hydrophobic. Could be. Bounder walls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should also mention the fact that this is a very active surface. Right. Very active surface. The worm has a gut tract, but it's a blind gut tract. Really? It, it's a tube from the oral sucker that leads into two compartments. They look like um, branches, mm -hmm. right? And they end blindly. Wow. Does anything go in this? That It does, Vince. It does. But we get to that as to what does this thing eat. But I'm just trying to tell you how it protects itself against being detected. So it wraps first. itself in serum proteins, basically. Yes, and so the the hypothesis is the hypothesis. Okay, and it's just an hypothesis is that it uses some protein on its own surface to interact with generic proteins of your blood serum proteins. So it's a protein protein interaction that we're looking at here. It's not very specific, though. No. It's not. So it's a capturing device which allows this parasite not only to take up your proteins, but if we could take the worm out of one host and put it into another one, we could show whether or not this is important to the biology of that life cycle. And that's exactly what Smithers did in England back mm -hmm. in the 1960s. He was the one that discovered this phenomenon, but he didn't know what the significance was. But I'll tell you what he did. He did, uh, he did an experiment where he took the adult worms from one host and transplanted them into another host by simply injecting them into the venules or into the veins that lead down into the mesenterics, okay? Because that's where this worm is going to end up. I, you know, I'm jumping all over the place here because I'm so excited about this parasite because it's got so much biology going on, okay? But let's just talk about the biology of the infection first, and then I'll get you back to this. But just keep that in mind. So the parasite in the liver starts to grow, and in fact, they achieve adulthood in the liver. And this is a worm that you can see with your naked eye, okay? It's millimeters long, not inches, but millimeters Where long. is it in the tissues of the liver? It's in the parenchymal tissue, and it's eating your parenchymal tissue. You know another worm that does that? Yes, <laughs> which one? Yeah. Which ones? Which ones? There's yeah, there's a lot one. of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was Ascaris, right? It ate part of your liver. Yeah, yeah. it did. Okay. It did. And you know, Toxicara will do that, and so will Strongyloides, and so will hookworm. Liver is a tasty place. It is. It's a human foie gras. Oh, <laughs> so here we have adult male and adult female worms in separate parts of the liver munching away on things separate that's the key they yeah. are separate mm -hmm. but they need to be together vince because they are just so much in love <laughs> no they just have to mate they need each other with, more they don't just mate vince they're like swans when they mate they mate for life uh. they don't just mate they are totally in love with each other 
and I'll give you the uh, well, I'm being a little bit anthropomorphic here, but uh, but when you see how they live, you'll understand what I mean. I once saw a pair of swans crossing a highway. Yes. One of them was run over. And the other one stood at the side of the road looking at the carcass of its mate. It's really so sad. That is sad. It was just standing there looking, waiting for it to get up, but it didn't. Elephants are like that too, by the way. So then that swan will just live a solitary life? I don't know. Of whether they'll remarry or not. So these guys mate for life. They do, but how do they find each other? Uh, some chemical. Must be. Must be. And I, the, the joke that I used to tell in class, which I got big groans on, so I'll tell it again, is the, they, how does the schistosome adults find themselves in the liver? I said it's the same way that elephants find each other in the mating elephants find each other in the tall grass how do mating elephants find each other in the tall grass i have no idea the answer is delightful <laughs> I, I know they I know. groan didn't they they do they thought you were an old fogey <laughs> no i was a young fogey then <laughs> <laughs> i was a cornball from start to finish so these parasites secrete molecules each one of which is sex specific and mutually attractive so trichinella has these molecules. Schistosomes now have these molecules. And I'm convinced that a lot of other parasites do too. Hookworm, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Very cool. If we could interrupt that process, we'd have it made. We could. I know we could, but we haven't investigated what those molecules are for the most part. So they're diffusing through the liver and they, they have are. a gradient. And then the other, they, they go towards each other's gradient. And they, then do, they, they do, they do, and they finally meet. Now the male being larger than the female, and he's got this gynecophoric canal. Mm. Like that little term? Gynecophoric. Gynecophoric. Okay. Or the gynecophoral canal. Gynecophoral canal, right. That's right. Oh, and that's where the female's going to go and stay there for the whole he life. He embraces her. Now, wait a minute. What if there's like <laughs> one male yes. and a bunch of females, or one female and a bunch of males? How do they sort this out? I don't even have to ask them on that one. Uh, I think that once a pair of worms is made, that's the end of that I understand, one. but you're assuming there are just two worms in this liver. There could be more. Oh, there more. are more. There are many and maybe more. multiple could encounter. How Correct. do they sort it out? I saw her first. You I don't know. Get lost. I don't know. Hey, I dated her sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Has she got a sister? Maybe that's what they ask. I don't know. But the point is that once a pair of worms forms... They They're stay together. There. So the female then stays with the male and doesn't swim off on her own ever. Correct. And swimming is the word because where do these worms go next? Here they are, a pair of worms. All right. They're in the liver. They've mated. Right. Anything happen after the mating? Do they... Plenty. Do they actually mate? Do they, does the male fertilize the female or... Yeah, sure. Or they, of just, course. they just stick no, together. It's an ongoing process. Ongoing. So then, when it's do more they... than that, Vince. It's more than that. Listen to this one: the male actually has to transfer a protein over to the female for mm -hmm. her to become fertile, not just sperm. It's a protein. Okay. And how do they feed? Well, they feed through their mouths, as I mentioned. Well, they've been they... feeding. They're eating the liver. You yes, said. Yeah. that's right. They feed. They digest what they can, and then they spew out the guts of the results of the stuff that they can't digest. Mm -hmm. That's what the male gives to the female? To no, 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 they both do it. They both do it. So they regurgitate yeah. the undigested portions of their meal to make room for more meal. Sounds like the Romans. <laughs> That's right. And what they eat when they get out of the liver to where they're going, they eat blood. They eat whole blood. So that's what they've been eating this whole time, blood. No, no, they eat liver cells in this case. Okay. To grow up to be an adult, they eat parenchymal cells. Once they grow up, they mate. How they find each other in the liver, remember the tall grass and the elephants. Right. But now they have to find their way into the mesenteric vein. How long has this been so far? Several weeks. Wow. But now they have to go to the mesenteric venules of the small intestine, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is the crossroads for intercepting all of host nutrition. Right. Because when you digest something and the small molecules are transported, they have to go through the mesenteric venules, through the veins into the liver. Right. It's detoxified, and then it's sent out to the body for processing. That's the factory that we've got. It's, this circulation is known as the splanchnic circulation. Interesting word. That. Splanchnic? Splanchnic, mm. yeah. All right. It involves the spleen and the pancreas and the liver and the uh, small intestine. So here these worms line up at the junction between the mesenteric venules and the... 
muscularis mm. of the small intestine. And that's where they choose to live. Remember, they're invisible to your immune system. So if you're a macrophage and you encounter this worm and you land on its surface, you'll think you're on the surface of yourself. You can't yeah. detect the difference. There's and that's maintained throughout this now, even with the male and female. Yes, together. but there's one other little nuance here. That it produces a beta-2 microglobulin-like molecule. Dixon, what is a beta-2 microglobulin? A beta-2 microglobulin molecule is a presentation molecule that the macrophage has on its surface, mm -hmm. which allows it to take antigen plus the beta-2 microglobulin and present it to an antigen processing cell. Okay. So this worm has stolen that little trick. And it says, oh, you've even got the beta-2 microglobulin. You're so, oh, you're one of us. Yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? Looks just like Arnold. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arnold smeared himself with mud. It's fascinating. He made himself invisible. It's an amazing process. These I mean, guys <laughs> make themselves invisible by smearing them with you. Correct. So, so at this point, Smithers realized that he might be able to have a vaccine here if he did the following. And he could prove how essential this process was by doing the following experiments. Uh, he had rabbits, and he had rats. And he could, you can cause this infection to occur in rats. They don't produce a lot of eggs, because it's an incomplete host. They haven't made any eggs yet, right? No, no eggs yet. Okay. But they will develop to adults. Right. Okay, and they will, essentially, if you grind them all up, after you've left them in culture for a while, it doesn't matter. They, they won't shed those proteins off their surface. They might regurgitate the stuff out of their gut tract, but they will retain those molecules. So what you do is you take these parasites and then you uh, grind them all up after they've regurgitated everything and you measure what's there and you say, what part of this is host? Mm -hmm. And you can identify all the host proteins just by doing a gel electrophoresis. Yeah, okay. sure. Then, then the next thing he did was he took living adult worms from rats and he transplanted them into rabbits. And then he did the same experiment again. Only this time he couldn't find any rat proteins. Instead, he found all rabbit proteins. So the parasite switched its mm -hmm. camouflage Smart. to the host. Yeah. Now, he did a third experiment, Vince. What would you do next? We just talked about this the other day because we saw this, the cover of Science had a peel-off advertisement for rabbit monoclonal antibodies. Rabbits are fantastic producers of precipitating antibodies. And those are the, the avidity of rabbit antibodies is much higher than mouse. And that's why it's such a good host for making antibodies in, right? What would you do if you were Smithers to show the significance of this camouflage? He didn't know at that point. He says, is this important or isn't it important? I don't know. So he took normal rabbit serum, or normal mouse serum, uh, sorry, back up, normal rat serum, mm -hmm. and he injected it into rabbits, and he made an anti-rat rabbit. Then he took rat parasites, washed them, washed them, washed them, mm -hmm. and transplanted them into the rabbits that were immunized against rat serum proteins. What do you think happened? Well, I would say that as soon as these parasites came in, they're coated with rat antigens. They were probably bound by the antibodies and cleared. Correct. The adult worms were killed. Yeah. And everyone was speculating these are too big to be killed by the immune system. Oh, no. So then it's opened up a whole field of people studying how you would kill an adult just to How were they killed by the immune system? Good Little question. compliment Fins. lysis, maybe? Little compliment lysis, maybe. Fag phagocytosis. Little, little IgE coming in there. Some macrophages participating, making yeah. holes. So it sounds like a good vaccine. It is a good vaccine, but... How would you vaccinate people against you can't, themselves? You can't do that. <laughs> you can't no, do it. It's only working in his case. It just yeah. shows you what the significance of the coating was to the parasite. In fact, the vaccine would be difficult because these guys are coated with your proteins. That's right. You, and it's very difficult to make an immune response against right. those. What he was looking at was the basic biology of schistosomes. Yeah, figure out the, yeah, the And he was cycle. a genius at, at working on that. And I actually had the privilege of knowing him and talking with him about this stuff. And it just... There's a whole field now involved in this. What was his name? Smithers. Smith Ron, Ron Smithers. Okay. Now, we're in the uh, intestinal circulation. We are. And these guys are just sitting in the arteries? 
Venules. Venules coming away. The returning from blood from the small intestine, taking all right. that nice nutrient laden stuff. And they're sitting there sopping it up and growing. So and making eggs. eggs. So now they start to make eggs. Eggs. Now, now you've got a problem, Vince. So they are an egg laying machine. They are an egg laying machine. They make them, and the female excretes them, she and does. then they go into the circulation. That's oh. a bad thing. It's a bad thing. For who? For the worm. Right. Because you want it to be excreted so right. someone else could pick it up. But we know that this parasite succeeds, yeah. so what's going on here? I don't know. Maybe they crawl to the, get into the intestinal lumen? Uh, no. No? No, it's more complicated than that, unfortunately. The, the birth pore for the eggs yes. is located between the anterior and the posterior sucker. Mm-hmm. There's a little pore where the eggs come out. Got it. Now, if the worms are sitting... With their sucker and their anterior sucker and their posterior sucker situated on the tissue themselves Mm -hmm. so that the birth pore is pressed up against the endothelial cells of the uh, venules. Mm -hmm. Then when the eggs come out, they immediately encounter host tissues, Mm -hmm. which stimulates this egg inside because it's fully developed already with another stage of the infection called the myricidium. To produce its own set of cysteine proteases, mm-hmm. which it then uses to penetrate right through the endothelial cells of the venules into the muscularis of the small intestine, through the lining of the small intestine, into the lumen of the small wow. intestine. It's quite this, a travel. This worm has a little corkscrew-like activity to actually make it from the tissue to the lumen. Huh. And it damages the hell out of us in doing so. It does. Yeah, it's awful. You, you see intestinal pathology. You sure do. There's a lot of GI bleeding. Wow. There's a lot of inflammation. There's a lot of gut damage. It's horrible. And it also produces something called uh, uh, malabsorption syndrome. A diarrheal disease comes from, uh, from this. To imagine, this is a disease primarily of little kids. As soon as they get old enough to swim. Yeah, yeah, sure. In Africa, that's what happens. Now... We have had a pair of adults Wait, mate, yes, and now we, how can they cause such extensive intestinal damage? They're in one place, they're small, they're secreting eggs, but that's just, you know, a square millimeter. You're right. That's one pair. Who cares? So and how but, do you get uh, more than one pair? Well, what I was going to tell you was that as these worms translocate along the epi- endothelial lining of the uh, mesenteric venules, the female actually lifts up her anterior sucker and stretches out, and then lifts up her, and then attaches, and then lifts up her posterior sucker and, and inches away like this. That's how they crawl from place to place. Oh, so they move around and lay eggs they in different do. places. They do. They do. Well, not too many different places, but in lifting up the posterior or the anterior sucker, it moves the birth pore away from the contact surface. So any eggs that are produced during that time, you're right, they wash backwards. Where do they end up? What's the circulation from the mesenterics? To the, to the liver, right? Exactly right. And they remove then. So the, the eggs get stuck in the pre-sinusoidal capillaries. Mm-hmm. Now, this egg has a unique feature on it. It has a little spine that sticks out to the side. Yeah, I see that in this, this photo here. That little yeah. spine catches on the pre-sinusoidal capillary tissue, and it right. sticks. Mm-hmm. It sticks in the lumen, and it plugs up. That capillary. Mm-hmm. One egg, who cares? Two eggs, who cares? Ten, who cares? A hundred, who cares? A thousand, who cares? Ten thousand, who cares? A hundred thousand, who cares? A million? I might start to care at a million. <laughs> Are, you serious? How about, Are you serious? Yeah. They can make a million eggs? Not one more. I'll tell you what the ratio is here, too. Because each one produces a different number of eggs per day. But remember, these things can live for 25 years. Is that right? That's a long time, Vince, so I, because they can hide from our immune system for that long. And then they are laying eggs all this time. Every day. And then you could get infected with more. Schistosoma mansoni lays about 3,000 eggs a day. So if, if you have several, you're making a lot of eggs. Right. So I would guess over time, if you swim a lot, you're going to get multiple infections. Correct. Right? Until the immune system catches on and starts to can, can kill them in the skin. Yeah. But in the meantime, you might have accumulated several thousand pairs of worms. 
Are you serious? Dead serious. Several thousand before your bloody immune system kicks in? When I said dead serious, I mean it. Wow. Because this parasite can kill you. And these are all settling at different places in your intestines. And so now I can see where you can have pathology. Millions and millions of eggs. Wow. And, and, well, let's say that half of the eggs that are produced make it out of the body. So they get into the lumen. Means the other they're, half They're dark. burrowed. And they're, yeah, that's fine. Just like viruses, you know, make, make a lot and a few work succeed so then you're sh they're shedding these in your stool yep and it ha has to get back in the water i would guess somehow exactly right because that's where the snails live and then it's going to infect the snail well the egg has to hatch next oh it hatches in the water it does the no. moment it hits fresh water dixon i have no clue how <laughs> feces would get into water are you kidding yes <laughs> when we were kids we swam at public swimming pools you know as well as I do that even smaller kids than us yeah. defecate randomly wherever they are. And if they're in a swimming pool, you're going to find so feces. So that's uh, the main excretors are kids here. Main. But, but, but I must also say that in disposing of human feces in certain unsanitary it places. It contaminates water. Yeah. Sure. That's so right. then the eggs go in the water, fresh water. Yeah, and by the way, there are some reservoirs. Notice I've said that there's a reservoir. There's a monkey here. here. Monkeys defecate in water all the time. So these monkeys have eggs produced in them just They've like They've got a whole infection just like us. With S. Mansoni. That's correct. And they're defecating in the water. Yeah, but it's not a major... Um, reservoir host. Humans okay. are the major. Most, it's humans. All right, so the water is full of these eggs. It they is. hatch in the water? They do. Really? They do. Is there any cue for hatching? There is. Uh, it's fresh water. Fresh water. Okay, as soon as they drop in the water, bing, it starts a program. And in how many days do we have a hatch day? Oh, instantly. It's almost like within hours. Okay. And now you've got a stage that swims around. It looks just like a paramecium. Mm -hmm. We can probably show a paramecium. Yeah, this is it here. This it's a ciliated stage. It's got cilia. Wow. And it swims around. And what is it looking for, Vince? It's looking for a, host. a snail. And it's following a trail of chemical signals given off by the snail. Curious why it evolved to select a snail. Look at how involved this Are thing is. Are snails everywhere? They're in all the freshwater systems. That and I there are, of course, of. saltwater snails, too. There are. But a lot of freshwater snails. And each species of schistosomes has a different set of snail hosts. I see. So if you took japonicum eggs mm -hmm. and dropped them into African waters, you wouldn't get anything. But interestingly enough, if you took schistosome mansoni eggs and dropped them into water in Central America or South America or even in Puerto Rico or St. Lucia, the right snail host was there. So how did those snails get there? And they might have gotten there from bilge water, from African ports, taking slaves and water. You know, you balanced off the missing slaves with more bilge water and more bricks, by the way, too. So a lot of these life cycles... Uh, per were perpetuated and, and initiated mm -hmm. through the use of bilge water and international trade. That's how yeah. cholera distributes throughout the sure. world, too. Yeah, so sure. you can understand how these things might get around. And birds could pick these up, too, by the way. And, you know, it could eat a snail, and the whole snail could reduce digestion and go right through. And as the bird defecates and puts it into another body of water, it starts a whole sure. colony. colony. So, so the, the paramecium, the ciliated paramecium-like... Like, Myricidium. Myricidium goes into the snail. How does it get in the snail? It penetrates with its own set of uh, cysteine proteases. Oh, it's not ingested by the snail. Oh, no, Vince. It's not that simple. It penetrates the foot, the, the soft foot of the snail. And, and then gets, once it gets there, it goes to an organ in the snail called the hepatopancreas. Mm -hmm. The hepatopancreas of a snail is huge. And it undergoes the most remarkable set of division cycles of any organism i think on earth hmm. it produces sporocysts and daughter sporocysts and then finally it produces the sicariae interesting and the snails are heavily infected some of them are almost near dying from this thing and they can shed thousands per day up to hundreds of thousands per day and they're stimulated to shed them by the sun so at night no shedding. During the daytime, shedding. And this corresponds to the ability of the parasite to detect the sun also. It's it's all coordinated and all... Why does it want to be out in the sun? Because that's when humans are swimming? Apparently so. 
Well, that's an adaptation or selection. Fabulous. So the cercaria come out of the snails. How do they come out again? They penetrate out, just like penetrate. the mirror sitting penetrated in. You know, hepatopancreas, I'm thinking, I've just read that recently, and I, just last week in Wired magazine, oh, yeah. I read about a parasite of snails that grows in the hepatopancreas, and then it migrates to the oh. stalks and make the, makes them big and colorful, and then birds come and eat them. That's a, It's called leucochloridium. Um, yeah. Oh, I forgot the genus, uh, the, the species of that, leucochloridium. I'll look at it. But it makes these colorful, yeah. huge eye And stalks. what does that do? It, it attracts, attracts birds. birds. And they eat it, and then they... That's, could, that's correct. It's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it? Poor snails lost its eyes. <laughs> no, those are the antennae. Antennae? <laughs> yeah, well, their eyes are at the end of it. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's alien times ten. Yeah. Alien time set. All of these, look at how complicated this is. If you had to try to make this up, and you say, okay, kids, let's make up an artificial life cycle for a parasite. Now, you have to include a snail and the outdoors and your liver and lungs and your skin. No one would have come up with this ever. Now, it's it's said here about men peeing blood in the urine. Oh, that's in the old days. As a, the uh, Egyptians so used to some think. Some of these worms get into your bladder? Yeah, we're going to discuss that because there are some differences between the species. Okay, sorry. It's okay. Sorry, sorry to go no, ahead. No, 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 you're asking all the right questions here. So the completion of the life cycle of Schistosoma hematobium is different. So we just talked about Mansoni. We did. So Mansoni, Japonicum, and Mekongi are similar. They all use different snail hosts, but Although they're... Although Japonicum they're, has different t- tissues that that's it's targeting right. and, and here. And we should have shown one other biggie over here that we didn't. This is not... This is Mansoni. This is oh, Japonicum. That's Japonicum. We should have shown one other big animal over here. Well, that, Mansoni, we had... Uh, monkeys. Monkeys as a reservoir. But, but for Japonicum, we should have shown the water buffalo. Uh, you don't have it in your picture, is that what you're saying? No. Yeah. Okay, so it water buffalo is a reservoir host. Yeah. It can become infected. It sheds eggs. And okay. So imagine what a problem that is in areas where they're used to plow rice fields. Sure, you can control human defecation events, perhaps, but to control the water buffalo defecating, come on, that's used as fertilizer. Yeah, yeah of course. And that that's, contributes to the problem. Well, you're going to ask me how the Japanese solved this problem. Not the Chinese, but the Japanese did solve the problem. Killing a water buffalo? Nope. They just they didn't kill them. They just stopped using them. So as, what did they use as instead? Fer- as fertilizer, you mean? No, 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 as plows, as, as mechanical see. plows. Yeah. So animals, the draft animals, they would call them, right? right? So they drafted another animal for this one. They used horses. Mm-hmm. Which are horses are right. far less susceptible. They're semi-susceptible, but much, 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 much less susceptible. Mm-hmm. And by substituting a simple inter- or a re- reservoir host, right. the, the horse for the ox, you completely wiped out just to summon Japonicum from Japan in 1972. I think that was their last case. Wow. Gone. Mm-hmm. No drugs, no vaccines, a simple behavioral change. They still could plow their fields. It had no difference whatsoever. The horse was just as good as the ox. And that got rid of it. Got rid of it forever. So there, they were not a pro- there. It wasn't a problem of human feces contaminating. Well, in the, the beginning, it was. And they got rid of that. Then everybody sanitized it, but they still couldn't get rid of it because and it was the wildebeest. No, not wildebeest. Not water right. buffalo. Water buffalo. Okay. That's right. Now the japonicum seems to have some different pathology here, according to your drawing. Yeah, it it has some narrow differences, and the the narrow differences turn out to be big ones if you look at what happens afterwards. The shape of the egg for japonicum and for mekonga are similar. Notice there's no big spine at the end of a of a japonicum egg. Right. It's nice and smooth. As a result, it can go through tissues. It doesn't get stuck in the liver sometimes. Uh. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I didn't tell you what happened. When enough pre-sinusoidal capillaries of the liver are blocked. Because this is part of the pathology of this infection. Blocked by? Eggs. Because these eggs have come from the intestine. Right, the and they don't, circulation, and yeah. they're dead. Once they go to the liver, right. they're dead. So, what do you have? An inflammation, inflammation of the liver. Yeah, and you get a granulomatous formation that's incredible. What's Oops. a granulomas? A granulomatous. What fer- is it? It's a it's a lesion created by mixed uh, white cells of various kinds, and it it undergoes a progression from an early to a middle to a late stage. It ends up as fibroid uh, epithelial cells. All right. All right. But it starts out with macrophages and neutrophils and eosinophils. And then it 
deteriorates to macrophages. And once the organism is killed, of course, then all the byproducts of its release, uh, its death, has to be taken care of too. And all of this material that accumulates is replaced with fibrotic uh, epithelial cells. It looks just like a pseudotubercle. Tub I was going to say tuberculosis. It's called right? a pseudotubercle. Except it's, Pseudo. in the except it's in the liver, right? Correct. Not in your lung. Uh, oh, it can be in the lung, too, because japonicum can bypass the liver because the eggs can slip through. Now, uh, Mansoni does not cause this liver pathology? It does cause this liver pathology. But in Mansoni addition, does it. japonicum can also do lung and other places, too. And in fact, this parasite can actually locate to different parts of the body. Much, It's much more of an animal parasite than a human parasite. Mm -hmm. And it locates in bizarre places in the humans, along the spinal cord sometimes, in the brain sometimes. That can be a problem, right? It can be a problem. Fatal. Because they're still producing eggs. Yeah. In fact, Mance and I can do this too. Rare, but it can do it. And then the heart, and then the lungs. That's right. It's called core pulmonale. Well, I'll, no, 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 no. I'll get to that part. So well, the pathology it? is complicated, but let's imagine the liver now starting to fill up we, with eggs. We have eggs. Monsoni now? doesn't or? matter which one. All three can do this. But Filling up with eggs. Dead yeah. eggs. And not hematobium, but the other three can do this. Okay. So the eggs accumulate in the liver. They're dead. They plug up the liver. And all of a sudden, at some point, let's say you have a trillion of these presinusoidal cow flurries per liver. Mm -hmm. When you've plugged up half of them, you're going to start to get portal hypertension. Portal hypertension. Like that word? Does that mean on your left side? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, port is left, right? No, I got it, I got it. I got it. <laughs> no, the posh hypertension is on the other I side. I got it. No, no, portal circulation, right? Yeah. Which is what, Dixon? What is the portal circulation? Well, the portal circulation is the circulation leading from the small intestine to the, to the uh, liver. Okay. That's the portal circulation. So you're going to block that up and put pressure on it. What's going to happen? Uh, it's going to back up to your intestines, Correct. Right? And then what's going to happen? Uh, I don't know. Ah, it starts to produce ascites fluid, which is mm. the equivalent of lymph. I the see. fluid part of the... You're absorbing water through the large intestine, right? And yeah. most of it is to the large intestine, but some of it is to the small intestine and lots of other things. You start to push back on this system and it pushes fluid out into the peritoneal cavity. And you get swollen belly. You get swollen belly. Is that... It's known as ascites. Happens when you have a tumor as well. That's right. But in this case, it's because of the blockage in the liver. That's right. So if you'd stuck a needle in this, a big 18-gauge needle, and yeah. just drew back, you'd Aspirated. get lots of yeah. fluid. And they do that to relieve pressure on the sure. organs sure. for these little kids, these poor little kids, mm. right, that are suffering from portal hypertension. Now, there's a fellow in this picture with hepatosplenomegaly that's different. The hepatomegaly is due to the fact that the liver starts to block. You're starting to push things through it, and the liver just starts to swell as a result of From that. the eggs blocking everything. Yeah. Right? And the spleen is also swelling, Well, too. because the blood is now being diverted away from the liver into the spleen. There's a shunt. There's a, this, this fellow has a huge spleen. An enormous spleen. Wow. There's another disease that gives you big spleen disease also. We discussed it earlier. That's malaria. But that's just splenomegaly. With schistosomiasis, it's hepatosplenomegaly. So if you do an examination in African kids, and the only thing you feel for is the spleen, mm -hmm. you'll probably miss a lot of schistosomes. Like you'll that. say it's malaria. You'll say it's malaria. That's and then right. You give them antimalarials, and it wouldn't That's help. Right. Then it wouldn't help. So but the liver actually goes down below the costal margin. You know what that? What's the costal margin? Costal margin is the the bony area of your rib cage, the bottom layer. Okay. And a good physician can actually feel below that, and he can feel the liver. Or she. Or she. That extends down below it as the result of hepatomegaly. You get this with hepatitis as well. Okay. So here you've got these two pathological syn syndromes, hepatosplenomegaly, and as a result of the portal hypertension mm -hmm. created by blockage of the presinusoidal capillaries. You can tell I've taught this a lot <laughs> because there's a, you, there's a rhythm to all of this as yes. to what happens next. There's a <laughs> cascade effect. Okay, so if the eggs can't go up through the liver, where does the blood go if it can't go through the portal circulation? I don't know. Well, there are remnants of the embryonic circulation in humans. Mm -hmm. And one of those remnants actually takes the blood around the liver and distributes it through the surface veins of the abdominal cavity. Mm. Right. 
which then returns the blood above the liver and puts it into the heart. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see these on the surface of a kid that's got a distended belly. They're called spider veins. Oh, they're all full of blood, right? And they're all full of blood, and it's because the blood is now being pushed back through this auxiliary circulation. Wow. It's an auxiliary circulation. Interesting. Well, what does this do, Vince? It takes the eggs and it moves them past the liver and lets them get into the lung fields next. But they're dead, aren't they? No, not at that point they're not. The eggs are not dead. No, these are live eggs that can no longer go to the liver because the liver's blocked up, so the liver circulation is oh, now I see. They're shunted bypassed. around, and yeah. now they can go to the lungs. That's bad, because they're going to hatch. They're going to do something in the lungs. Well, they'll get stuck in the lungs, too, They'll get Vince. stuck. They'll get and then stuck. they start to block up the lung field capillaries, and you get something totally different there. You don't get hepatosplenomegaly there. What you get is blood pressure back on the heart. Mm-hmm. And that is what core pulmonal is. Wow. And you get an enlarged heart. You get, can you have heart failure from that? Oh, yeah. Big time. You know, you get another thing, too. When you get a big spleen, mm -hmm. all right, and it doesn't matter what causes it, you get thrombocytopenia. What does that mean? Well, penia means not enough of, I think. And thrombocytes are, another name for them is... Red blood cells. No, no, they're platelets. Erith erythrocytes. Platelets. Platelets. Thrombocytes are platelets. Not red blood cells. No. What do platelets do, Dixon? Oh, Vince, they help you clot your blood. All right. So what if you don't have them? You don't have enough, so you're going to bleed. And you've got all these little vessels that are expanding. And they break and you bleed. And there's another set over here in your esophageal area called esophageal varices, mm -hmm. but there are venules that also expand due to portal hypertension. The same varices develop in people with uh, cirrhosis for um, heavy drinking. Because of portal hypertension. That's correct, because mm -hmm. the liver is now plugged up with a different for a different reason, yeah. but it doesn't function anyway. Wow. Right, so you get all these horrible things happening. Now, another thing that happens, of course, what does the liver do? Detoxifies, filters. Yes. yes. It detoxifies. And if the blood is being shunted around the liver, it doesn't detoxify it. Mm. So then what happens? You get toxic. Where? In your brain. Correct. You can develop something called toxic brain syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it's certainly a possibility. And, and imagine if a kid has hypertension as a result of heavy infection with schistosomes, and in addition to that, you've got toxic brain syndrome developing. Imagine how difficult it is to process normal information and to learn, for instance. Even if you could cure this afterwards, you've got all that damage that was done during the height of the pathology of this thing. It's a horrible disease. And how many people did you say were infected? I, said, I think you said 600 million. <laughs> 600 million and, and counting. Why would you let it get to this stage, Dixon? Well, Vince, there are many places in the world where You don't have health care. Right? None. None. But if you... What's the earliest you could pick it up and then... Try and treat it. Well, if you thought to look in the stool yeah. of little kids to see whether they were infected or not with schistosomes, yeah. you could detect it this way. Or if you just did a survey of the snails in an area that you suspected as being an endemic center, right? and you found those stages in the snails, you'd made your diagnosis that way too. So then you could, how would you treat someone? You know, it turns out that there are, is an interesting, good wonderful drug that unfortunately the schistosomes are becoming resistant to called praziquantel. We've discussed this before. Uh -huh. For what? Uh, tapeworms. I see. It interferes with the uh, calcium ion channels that are transporters, molecules, dependent. Mm -hmm. And uh, praziquantel actually interferes with the uh, communication system linked to calcium metabolism. Mm -hmm. But only in worm nervous systems. Not in humans. So you can treat, and that will get rid of all the worms and the eggs and everything will be gone. You'll well, be it fine. kills the adults. That's right. So if the adults are killed, where do you think they end up? Um, well, they're in the liver. <laughs> right. No, they're not in the liver. They're in the mesenteric, mesenteric venules. Mesenteric venules. They end up back in the liver. Yeah. And then they plug up a whole bunch of other stuff. That could be a mess. Uh, it is a mess, Vince. It's a mess. It's a big mess. But the, it, the bottom line, Dixon, it's not good to have worms in you. Period. Unless you have Crohn's disease. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> no. I thought we talked about hookworm. We did. We did. And, uh, you know, that's a different worm, obviously. But this is a bad player. This is a real bad, bad actor. Do we have it in the U.S.? No. Okay.
It's in so Puerto you, Rico. You never saw it here. Oh, you must have seen it here from people coming oh, from Puerto Rico. Tons right? of it during the sixties and seventies. So lot you, of it. a lot of these symptoms you've talked about, you would see here. Yeah. Sure, and there used to be some horrible drugs that you had to give for this before the discovery of prosequential. There was something called fuadin. Mm-hmm. It was named after King Fuad of, of Saudi Arabia. You had to give it as a twenty injection series intramuscularly, and every time you gave this, it caused a necrosis of the tissue. Can you imagine how painful the second or the third or the fifth or the tenth. No one showed up for the twentieth. It's terrible. It's it like, did work. So almost like was, the old rabies. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So vaccine. Now I see here on schistosoma hematobia. Yeah, we're we going to discuss different. the difference here now. So now we have a different problem. Same entry. Same Cir- entry. Circaria. It looks similar. Hair follicle. Go to the liver. Liver. After they get to the lung fields, so yes. they go to the lungs and then the liver, out into the. Oh, but they don't go to the mesenteric. No, it's not in this picture. <laughs> no, they go to the venous plexus. What's the venous plexus? This is another name given to the circulation surrounding the bladder. The venous plexus of the bladder. So the bladder Is that turns, because it looks like the shell that Venus was born in? I don't... You'll have to ask an anatomist on that one. I All don't right. know the answer. But I do know that this worm seeks out the concentration of urea... Oh, really? And follows that concentration. And it's highest in the bladder. Right next to the bladder. It doesn't go into the bladder. It stays in the venules yes. surrounding the bladder, and it lays its eggs so that they penetrate into the muscularis of the bladder, which is all smooth muscle at this time, right? And then eventually, and the same is true for the small intestine, by the way. That's smooth muscle as mm-hmm. well. And then it gets into the lumen of the bladder and then out into the urine and out into the environment. There's some big differences here, though. One of the biggest is that if these worms are around long enough, the eggs that build up in the bladder tissue can actually induce cancer, a mesothelioma. But it's not the eggs themselves that do it. There are co-carcinogens associated with this that are associated with industrialized areas. And they haven't identified, actually, which entities are responsible for this. Because schistosoma hematobium alone doesn't do it. Schistosoma hematobium plus Mm -hmm. does it. Now, this is the one that was referred to in the papyri. Yes. uh, Because there's bleeding associated with this, okay? Little kids that have this infection for the first time uh, develop, just like the kids with schistosoma uh, mansoni. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they could have both. Because this worm, they're both found in the same place. You could be infected with both. You I mean, can. You can have hematobium and mansoni if miserable. you live in Egypt. Miserable. Very much so. So you'd have bleeding GI and you could have bleeding urine. Now, blood in the urine, of course, signified in women an onset of puberty. Mm-hmm. So they thought, you know, males have the same thing because, look, there's blood in the urine. Yeah, sure. It was for a totally different thing, of course. It's just the Psalms. Right. Wow. Amazing. This is, These are, this is wreaking havoc. These are incredible organisms because of their stick in biology. They make use of what looks like really far-out mechanisms for going from one mm-hmm. series of environments to another. I mean, they have to withstand fresh water, the environment of a snail, fresh water again, <laughs> yeah. the environment of a mammal, and then they have to fight off the immune system at the same time, and they have to camouflage themselves how did they learn all of this stuff? Trial and error. Evo- evolution. Trial and yeah. error. If something doesn't work, you're gone. That's right. So was this a parasite of snails first or of mammals? Well, hmm. snails have been around a long time and mammals haven't. So Could one have would imagine sure. that this was a parasite of snails. Could have, sure. I mean, it would exist in snails alone, sure. But you would have had to have, well, snails have their own set of parasites and none of them look like this. None of them. In fact, all trematodes, I'm going to stick my neck out here and try to remember my trematode biology, but I I think every single trematode Mm -hmm. has snail intermediate hosts. Really? Yeah. Let's see what it says here in your book. (laughs) You're going to hold my words against me again. Well, there's a little introduction here. No, I think they all do. I think they all have snails as intermediate hosts. So this would be called a liver fluke? No, that's a different one. The schistosomes are blood flukes. Those are blood flukes. Mm, Snail, snail, snail. There is one trematode called Dicrocelium dendriticum, which has one of our readers, actually, listeners, actually wrote in and asked me to describe that life cycle. 
because it involves an ant. It's a remarkable life cycle. And I, I will do so uh, after I re-familiarize myself it with it. It doesn't say anything about all of them requiring snails in your chapter anyway. Right, but... It might. As far as I know, they all do. Or, yeah, as far as I know, they all do. Does that bring us to the end of Schistosoma? Vince, we could talk about this one for a long time. Really? I mean, sure. Even the epidemiology of this thing is just incredible. And so we could do another episode? We could do another episode on Because I think we should stop here because we've done an hour and a half. We have. Yeah. Notice how <laughs> quickly the hour and a half went. It went like crazy. It yes. did. It did. Um, I, w let's do two emails. How's that? Sounds good to me. They're both about strongaloides. Uh-oh. Here Do you go. remember Strongaloides? I, I'll try my best. The first is from uh, Jim, our friend in Virginia. Professor Dixon, he says, does the same concern that you discussed with suppress immunity after a transplant apply to folks who undergo chemotherapy for cancer? Yes. With respect to Strongaloides, yes? It does. It does. Yes, it does. Indeed, it does. Immunosuppression in a patient exhibiting uh, cryptic uh, cyclical episodes of uh, Strongaloides below the clinical horizon can be brought up above the clinical horizon simply by immunosuppression. That's right. All right. The next one is from Spencer, who is an MD-PhD. Mm -hmm. Vincent and Dick, on your Strongaloides episode, you spoke about final eradication of organisms such as poliovirus. It was Dick's contention that the virus could be reconstructed from synthesizing the DNA, whose sequence <laughs> is known. Are there any instances that you are aware of where a full virus or other living organism... Yes, I know, viruses may not be living, <laughs> were constructed in this way such that they could go on to have a normal life cycle and replicate. In other words, is just the creation of the DNA sequence sufficient for recreation of a virus? As always, thanks for making my day when I see that email announcement of a new episode. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You answer that one, Vince. That's in your bailiwick. Well, the, what we did with polio is to make a DNA copy, but... The DNA makes RNA, which then initiates the normal viral life cycle. So right. it doesn't exist as a DNA. We've never started from scratch with just the four nucleotide base pairs and just we have made it. Oh, made a random virus? Yeah. No, no, oh. not a random virus. Well, polio has been made by just putting together the nucleotides. Sure. And typing it out on a DNA synthesizer and just getting the yeah. whole thing to well, come out. Yeah, more or less. You have to make <laughs> small pieces and put them together. Okay, but, but the, so the answer is yes. Yes, you, you can make DNA and then you make RNA from it and put that into a cell and it will give you virus. And for many RNA viruses, you can do that. Of course, for DNA viruses, where the viral genome is DNA, you just make the DNA and you put it in a cell and it begins to, right. to replicate. Has anyone done this with any other organism besides polio? Well, remember the microbe created by Craig Venter? Yes. So we've discussed this on a few other, I think, TWIVs. We have. So he synthesized a multi-million base pair genome. Just to prove he could. Yeah, I mean, it's not free living. It had to be, it was a mycoplasma, right? Right. If you remember. So yeah, yeah, it did right. replicate. So it was created from a sequence. So, you know, the you could create an organism one day, but you have to, for a, for a eukaryotic organism, you have to take the DNA and put it somewhere where it can be expressed. Right, like the Jurassic Park type of episodes that they depicted in that movie. Yeah. You know the premise for that one, sure. right? Yeah, so we haven't so, quite advanced to that level yet. As someone wrote on either Twip or Twiv, he imagines one day where we make modules and you want to swap out <laughs> some feature of an organism, you'll put a DNA module in for that maybe. Right. For viruses, it's easy because the virus needs a host in which to replicate. So you put the nucleic sure. acid in the host, the nucleic right. acid that you synthesize, and it will initiate a cycle. Yeah, yeah. For eukaryotic organisms such as ourselves, it's harder. And that's why Venter had to put, uh, he, he basically took the genome out of a mycoplasma and replaced right, it. Right. And showed that it would replicate to yep. simplify matters. Right. All right, that will do it for another TWIP. You can find us on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and at microbeworld.org slash TWIP where you can download or play episodes. As always, we'd love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twip at twiv.com. TV. Dixon de Palmier, thank you for enlightening us about schistosomes. Pleasure. It was really very gruesome. They're amazing, aren't they? 
I think more than any of the ones we've talked about, these seem to cause the most yeah. damage, don't they? So, well, malaria was pretty bad too. Yes, but this one is a multi-organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this, once it get once it gets out of control, this hmm. was this is the one you wouldn't want. Dixon is at trichinella.org, verticalfarm.com, and medicalecology.com. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.